Okay, uh, thank you, JC. <laughs> okay, now um, I have the pleasure to uh, to introduce our last speaker, who is our host also here. It's Dr. Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez. Uh, he currently is a professor in zoology at the Animal Biology Division of the Institute of Biological Sciences at the University of the Philippines in Los Baños. Uh, he completed both his zoology studies in the bachelor's and master's in UPLB and is doctor of philosophy in zoology at Oxford University in 2012 through a Ford Foundation scholarship. Uh, he's, he was appointed as 11th director of the UPLB Museum of Natural History and continues as a curator for birds and zoological and wildlife museum, which houses a large part of the Rabor collection, which is world famous. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce what we in the biodiversity community, who the, in the biodiversity community fondly call as JC. Okay, so I'll give the floor to Dr. JC Gonzalez on his presentation on safeguarding natural history collections in the new normal. So, so JC, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, sir, Ben. So uh, I'll just share my screen. Ayan po. Ito na po aking screen. So yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be talking about uh, safeguarding and uh, natural history collections in our new normal, of course, with our current pandemic. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, the Philippine Academy uh, uh, Philippine American Academy for Science and Engineering for hosting, for allowing us to talk uh, today at the 40th APMS. So um, we're experiencing um, a lot of innovations and globalizations uh, during this time of what we call the Anthropocene. So there, it is the current geological age um, where human has a dominant influence, particularly on climate and environment. So a lot of museums, actually I've been to a lot of the uh, museum conferences and that's sort of uh, the current focus that we uh, look at our impacts into uh, nature. So it's our time of living um, uh, in the Anthropocene and of course how natural histories would react to that age of humanity. And I'm, I'm showing here a slide of uh, the Carnegie Museum and they're showing all the um, extinct species that we of course affected through the years. So a lot of natural history museums have evolved worldwide. We no, no longer consider them as a menagerie. Uh, it's no longer a set of dusty cabinets full of oddities and stuff. So it has changed a lot. Um, there's a more global uh, approach, but also a lot of museums are now looking into a regional approach, uh, what they have around our area. So that's one of the focus of, of uh, the university museum that we have at MNH is to focus on Philippine biodiversity. Of course, emphasize the ones that you find around Mount Makiling. A lot of them are ecosystems based rather than just taxon based. And of course, a lot of changes there have interactive display. So of course, you remember that tip, but if you go to the museum, I don't touch. So now you can actually please not touch the specimens and feel what they are. So there's actually some specimens who have fur and feathers so you can interact with them. And um, there's a lot of live exhibits as you see here uh, with a child peering into a aquarium. There's a lot of captive breeding involved in, involved in it so they would of course, have the, to fig, fill in the live exhibits. There's a lot of interesting in uh, amalgamation of culture and art into what the importance of biodiversity is, as well as, of course, going to uh, genetic research, focusing on how science is involved in expeditions, how to create expeditions, and of course, focusing as well on conservation education. So it's, it's important that we emphasize on our impacts uh, to natural history. So it's now, uh, we look at it as a center for the awareness of impacts of both innovation and of course our impacts, which is perturbation. So how much we have changed the earth. So we look into these four things. One is post-natural. We've domesticated a lot of species. There's a point where a Chihuahua and a Great Dane are no longer, of course, able to breed. There's a lot of genetically modified organisms that you see here. Uh, with the malarial research resistant uh, mosquito. Uh, of course, it is important to help combat malaria. We've done a lot of habitat alteration. Um, as you see on the bottom picture, that set of urban wildlife that you see in Pittsburgh. Um, and also emphasize now on a lot of urban wildlife in the Philippines, especially in lockdown, a lot of people see every, all the animals and plants around their house. 
Uh, and we, that also includes a lot of impacts of invasive alien species because we've introduced and traveled and brought in a lot of things. For sure, during Mu'ulan po ngayon, you've heard a lot of frogs and probably most of the frogs you hear while it's raining are actually introduced species. Um, the impacts of pollution, pesticides, and climate change. You now have experiencing a lot of coral bleaching, um, a lot of decline that are unusual, such as for the honeybee decline, and the impacts of pollution on seabirds. And of course, leading to that decline, we've made a lot of extinctions, both through over-exploitation and persecution. And with that, we put into a lot of value on the specimens that we collected through the years. So they become important baselines. So these historical and heritage collections are very much relevant. So it's interesting that we make something old and of course relevant and, and current. Um, they, uh, they serve as permanent records. Uh, we value all the, the species that we've lost as well as recognized species that are new. And of course, it's a basis for comparative studies. Anything that's changed through the years from the historical to the current. Uh, it's still a great resource for DNA. So consider that as a historical DNA. Anything older than that would be ancient DNA. Uh, we'd focus into global access. We're trying to be more global in terms of collaboration and research. Um, for now in the Philippines, because of 9147, it's good that we have it because it helps protect our wildlife and our, our natural resources, uh, but also it helps restrict uh, research. So there are restrictions in terms of the collection in the wild. So we now have to consider uh, what to collect and what not to collect. Um, museums are now also threatened by, surprisingly, fire and theft. If you've heard of the news, uh, Brazil lost two sets of collections in two fires. Um, and then there was two sets of theft in the UK in museums. They were uh, stealing bird feathers and rhino horns. So yes, we do have that danger. So naman wala pong manakaw sa museum namin. Um, and with that, the museum is, of course, uh, trying to be at par with the global standards occurring now uh, with all the museums around the world. So in terms of collections management and research, so we, we think that the MNH is at the forefront of these current programs of these global museums. Um, so we do have a lot of uh, seminars and, of course, research in the field, as you see in these photos. So with the talk, um, I'm sharing this with my staff. So this is a photo of the staff of the Museum of Natural History. These are the regular staff. We have also have project staff added in. So we're, I'm very lucky we have 19 staff, which are regular. And I'm enumerated here are uh, my co-authors, which are also our researchers or reps, uh, Florante Cruz, uh, Judas Parpon, uh, Jeremy Cardenaredo, Michelle San Pascual, David Unwal General, Marianne De Leon, and of course, Camila Meneses. So I know they're on the audience right now. Hello, Paul. So I'm also with the Institute of Biological Sciences as a professor in zoology, where our, as a director, I am a seconded staff from the faculty. So uh, of course, we have our curators here as well, and some of the curators watching uh, now in the audience. So one of the things we have at the museum now is integration of art and live exhibits. We thought that uh, putting in that interest of both uh, anthropological and our aesthetic or artistic kind of tie in with the, the natural history component. So here we have the epicenter or the epiphyte center, which focuses on Hoyas and orchids. And of course, the um, out of sight from the our museum building is the Hortorium, which used to be the, the CA Arboretum. We still have an amazing set of um, riverine forest. And of course, dun po plant yung interesting species, uh, both natural and uh, domesticated species. So we have a set of uh, bamboos, the bambusetum, the palmetum. Um, so a lot of interesting things in the horatorium. Um, for animals, we have a herpetarium. We have a set of live frogs um, and snakes. And, and in sectary, as you see here, uh, we're breeding the Farnasia magdiwang, uh, which is one of the largest and most interesting uh, sticks, insects in the Philippines uh, from Cebuina Island, first described by Dr. Litt. We have sets of aquaria, uh, which features interesting native fish. Um, we also have the medicinal plants and a lot of interesting cultural uses that we integrate into the exhibits. We focus now on natural history photography. Um, actually recently our staff undergone training, uh, in-house training on photography, which was led by Florante Cruz. Our staff are also experienced and adept scientific illustrators. Um, so we also focus on that. Apart from that, we have, of course, 
gone through the modernization of systematics by the application of molecular techniques in high-res imaging. Um, it's not just about stuffed animals in the exhibits anymore. So uh, we tried to go into that initiative of R coding and making use of molecular systematics as the basis of uh, looking into relationships and uh, species limits. So I myself have looked into uh, historical DNA sampling uh, with hornbills that I used with my PhD. Um, Dr. Dylan is using micro, uh, molecular techniques in analyzing her uh, microbes at the molecular uh, culture collection. Um, as you see here, there's, uh, that's part of the, the photographic session where they look at really good images of arthropods, so digital images as vouchers, apart from the ones which are pinned. So I think that's the importance of natural history photography now, especially with a lot of equipment that are being more accessible to us. And of course, there's a lot more tools that we can use uh, that can help us see a bit more clearly into the morphology. So we think of those new tools as well as programs or applications, software, as emerging tools for systematics. Uh, the museum is also um, into multidisciplinary research. Of course, we are a wide group. We have a lot of curators involved and a lot of taxon groups involved. Uh, and thus, we go into expeditions together. And it's, of course, multi-taxa. Um, we go into cave biodiversity, uh, uh, forest canopy wildlife, as well as biodiversity on islands. We focus on topics of climate change impacts, as well as microbes and disease that cause diseases in, in wildlife. So here are some of the um, photos of the, the staff have been in El Nido Palawan. Uh, what we wanted to, to do with the museum is make it more um, uh, globalized. And we have like to focus, it's, it's one of the focus of a lot of museums worldwide is sharing. Um, it allows a more global connectivity. Um, it also allows us to access a database. So it's not just us accessing, we have to also upload our information. Um, there's of course certain um, limitations of what you can access, it depends on which museum it is. So it's important to put into account uh, the digitization of records. Um, so here's um, an example of our uh, samples in herbarium. So um, the CAHUP or the um, College of Agriculture Herbarium University of the Philippines, which is another name for our botanical herbarium, um, actually came back from a conference in Japan and they actually thought, that, yeah, why we need to digitize our records and make it more available to in influence not only study but also interest and collaboration. At the same time, we, me and uh, Mr. Naredo went to the Society for the Protection of Natural History Collections in Chicago. We also had the same influence of, of digitization. And that's what we wanted to discuss when, in, in the CLADES conference. And with that, we were fortunate to have, together with the Dr. Farmer, Curator for Herpetology, we went to a GBIF training workshop, and that kind of helped us develop the proposals. So we do need to emphasize on still using the museum and its collections. Uh, so it's what I call, call it heritage collections. A lot of the collections are part of the original collection that was deposited by a lot of the famous taxonomists. Uh, in my case, this is from Dr. Diosgoro Rabor, who collected a lot of uh, birds and mammals and, and uh, reptiles during his time. And, and these were collected in the 50s and 60s, a lot of which you cannot see anymore. Um, so we want to emphasize they are priceless, irreplaceable specimens, but still we need to make use of it and understand it. Uh, it's not just going to be kept in a drawer forever, so it has to be sustainably used. So because of that, we are a center for biodiversity research and conservation. Um, all life of Nesvite, uh, from microbes to mammals. That's a very wide uh, coverage of all the species of organisms uh, in the Philippines. And we think it's an important base to look into taxonomy because taxonomy matters. It is vital for understanding biodiversity. Some of the uh, focus that one of our, our staff and our curators are working on is on insect and arachnid systematics, um, into mycology, medicinal botany, um, uh, malacology, particularly on microsnails. Uh, there's an integrated group of uh, curators studying bats, as well as their bat guano, the, looking into the microbes that live in bat guano. Um, of course, we have uh, herpetofaunal studies, both amphibians and reptiles, as well as surveys on birds and mammals. And of course, our different researches, which are multidisciplinary on cave ecology and forest botany. 
So we also have the availability of those collections as a tool for teaching biology or the biological sciences or the natural sciences. Um, a lot of uh, the students that come over and use the collections are the ones uh, taking courses in museum herbarium curatorship, which is uh, offered by the Institute of Biological Sciences, including the students who study cave ecology. Um, there's a lot of students taking taxonomy, both plant and animal taxonomy, and all the associated systematic courses. Uh, of course, in UP, we, we still uh, teach a lot of the taxon-based studies, uh, botany, entomology, and zoology have all the malacology, theology, herpetology, ornithology, uh, entomology, and mammalogies. Um, I hope I've gone through it, of course, uh, including microbiology. So we help support uh, these uh, courses when they, of course, nowadays it's um, a little bit online, so we'll, it's sort of halted for the time. Um, we also in support of training courses in museum internships uh, in the past, and of course, support of So this is an example of the most recent um, internship. Uh, of course, it was the last because uh, of COVID-19, the pandemic, shut us, uh, 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 close the museum, we're unable to accept um, internships at the moment. Um, of course, our exhibits are open to the public. Um, it has exhibits on Philippine biodiversity. We have, so it's our way of, of, of providing uh, the visitors a way to understand Philippine natural history. Um, we also have our biodiversity seminar series at our uh, conference room. We also allow museum internships. Um, of course, internships are integrated within uh, UPLD uh, for students within the UP system. We have in-house and, of course, external uh, training on um, species identification, museum techniques, including this one, just an in-house training on natural history photography. Of course, and the staff are involved in discovery of new taxa. You see on the upper picture, uh, Mr. Enral is uh, showing his photo of Rumblena. Uh, Corazon, was it? Uh, named after Corazon Aquino, the former president. Um, we have novel studies in both medicinal plants, cave microbes, um, insect spiders, and of course, recently on bat viruses, which I think is a lot of concern because of our uh, current pandemic, which is derived from a coronavirus. So with the global impacts of this present pandemic, I think we're all feeling it, we want to adjust ourselves to what we call the new normal. So here on the one side is what we had before this pandemic, a lot of visitors come in, especially kids. And on the other side is, of course, that says me part on front, um, a closed museum because it's now closed up to all museums are closed uh, on community quarantine. So still we have to keep the museum open um, and uh, so we have to develop well, uh, and apply new biosafety protocols to keep the office running. We are, of course, lucky because uh, Dr. Marin Delon is a DOH trained biosafety officer. So we have our own biosafety officer. Um, we're also lucky because UPLB has opened its testing center. So it's more accessible for us. We follow the IATF guidelines. Uh, we actually put out a memo on, on bios biosafety guidelines within the museum. Uh, it helps, of course, measure our own safety, but also safety for visitors. Um, we have a reduced skeletal workforce following, of course, government rules. Um, we also did a hybrid schedule for, uh, to reduce the number of, uh, because we have, of course, 19 staff, we reduced that schedule for, to both in office and work from home. Um, at the moment, we are MECQ, so we are on uh, lockdown. Uh, we also look into the importance of safety in fire, typhoon, and earthquake. So here are some of the, I uh, know these are the memos, so we'll just kind of breeze through them. I'll show you the advice that we've been closed for a while. We'd also close for disinfection. Um, we have a protocol on the website. So you go to the website of the, uh, the MNH, you have new MNH protocols for client visits. So if you do are interested to, to come and visit the museum, uh, not as to see the exhibit, but also for uh, other services, um, that is the page to go. We've also adjust our operations in terms of continuing the services of the museum. Um, for us, we're still meeting via Zoom uh, and chat box. Um, I've never used messenger chat box and then hangouts as much as I could before. Um, also been Zooming a lot. I think we're all Zoomers at this age. Um, we've converted our uh, biodiversity seminar series into webinars. And of course we have new guidelines. So these are some of the recent um, 
interviews that was done in, in the museum. Of course, that will change because you have new sets of interview uh, guidelines for interviews. Uh, of course, the online museum services from specimen identification, scientific name verification, loans and donations, of course, have changed. I have to move it online, uh, including payments because our cashier is closed. Uh, and of course, you have no access to collections at the moment. So here are some of the examples. Again, you can go to the website uh, to look into our services for bio, uh, biological specimen identification. And they have those sets of guidelines that change into for uh, identification services during this community quarantine. We also have to look into the, how the museum is in terms of uh, contribution. Um, and we think the online platform is perfect. So we actually have all our social media platforms in place, but we now emphasize further on its use. So it's not just maintaining, but making full use of your social media platform. So of course, uh, the recently updated the MNH webpage, which is uh, uh, monitored and developed by for our extension coordinator, uh, Florenti Cruz, uh, have all these uh, social media platforms. I think everyone has their own Twitter accounts, their Facebook accounts, their, in, their IGs or Instagram accounts. Uh, there's a lot more other accounts I haven't used, but we also have our TripAdvisor and Google Community and Hangout. We do have our uh, own MNH channel or YouTube channel. So please do uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we've opened up our and put back our own online journal. It's open access called Laksan Buhay. And recently we developed the, through the help of the uh, college, uh, the um, computer science department uh, on a virtual tour of, of the museum, as you see there. So this is the walkthrough. It's VER 2A of the UPLB Museum of Natural History. So here is our Facebook account, our YouTube account, our TripAdvisor, and of course, Luxembourg. So again, it's amazing that now we're making making full access. It's not just local, but also global reach um, for the museum. Oh, by the way, our virtual tour is 3D, so you need to use the special goggles to see that. So it was developed uh, by a student uh, from uh, the Department of Computer Science, us, computer, the Computer Science Institute. Um, we also continue to safeguard our collections. It's a little hard because of the movements in between our buildings, because the museum building has the exhibits, but not all the collections are there. actually in three different uh, buildings. So access is a little difficult. So we have to uh, help uh, maintain and safeguard those collections as well as the live collections. So what's interesting is because of the lockdown, we've always kept things sanitized. So it's nice smelling, clean and sanitized. Of course, uh, there is no lockdown for collections. You also have to uh, access those collections. As you see here, so we have developed that hybrid schedule and so we have managed the collections. It's time to fumigate things that we couldn't do before because uh, so time to fumigate, top up also the collections as you see here in the herpetological collections. Um, the alcohol, so you have to top up that ethyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol is a little difficult because you know, it's being used in, for, in, in the pandemic. Um, we also focus now on what things we can do online and at home, such as building up our grant applications and again, publications, doing the database management. That comes in with the digitization. I think that's the time we can, you're always in front of the computer and do, do the database management. And of course, we have a skeleton staff that helps maintain our live collection here, as you see, we avoid with the FT Center. Also, what are the implications of this pandemic in terms of museum work in expedition. So it's, uh, field and lab work have been restricted, so it's a little hard. So there, we can't do, uh, it's hybrid work. So there's a lot of work that's not necessarily been done. Major prioritize. So there's limited support for instruction because a lot of the subjects are online or uh, in hybrid form. There is a moratorium in travels and permits. So. It's really hard. So a lot of our projects, including two, which is the Polito Bat Cape project, has to be ended or hold. So depends on, on how the pandemic occurs. So you have to change our mindset in terms of travel. Um, there's limited lab access. You have to either use another lab or move to another lab, depending on how access is available. And of course, all our, on, our conference and symposia, we have, uh, 
wanted to go to are now online. And of course, um, some of our staff are above 60, so they must work from home. So um, focusing on that digitization, as, as Dr. Lip mentioned earlier, um, is um, we wanted to put into that use of being more globalized. So imaging and digitization, it's kind of my, my mouthful, uh, for museum uh, records to be more remote access. You can access the museum collections uh, from that database, that online database. So we wanted to be more, not only local, but also global. Because again, the collections are closed uh, during this pandemic. So we, we developed the new, from those times that we've developed the proposal, there's a new digitization project. So it's called the digitization and mobilization of regional heritage biological specimens at the UPLD Museum of Natural History. That's part one. Uh, hopefully we can do sample series. It's funded by the Biodiverse Information Fund for Asia. Uh, of course, it's led by our uh, collections, our coordinator for collections, uh, Jeremy Carlin Arredo. And it's, uh, it aims to provide biodiverse data to the GBIF system, which allows remote access. So uh, here's an example of what GBIF is. So you can actually, this is an example of just looking into the occurrences will, by just typing in the information you need, so I've typed in Rabor, Makiling, and uh, wildlife, or, or, and then came up with this set of specimens that you find all over, data set from all over the world. So hopefully the museum would be included in that. And of course, we still plan to reopen. Hopefully, a lot of museums in Europe have reopened. Although again, it depends on the Philippine government, what their ticket is into opening certain areas, such as museums. Um, but we have to prepare for it and accessibility for the new normal. So again, museums are all closer to a community quarantine. Once it's changed, you have to be ready for that opening. We also have a planned renovation, uh, the modernization of the Museum of National History Building, which you see here, uh, uh, artist concept. Um, that is put on hold, but of course, if it allows, we'll be, go back into the renovation. Um, there is a maximum number of visitors you can allow into a museum. You have to think about the biodiversity, uh, no, sorry, the biosafety requirements for each of those visitors, depending on the age. But I think we still have to disallow the and just uh, anything below, follow the 21 to 59 uh, age limit. Um, we also have to change the exhibits. Uh, there's less life, it's harder, because of the pandemic, it's harder to access the museum. So there are no interactive displays anymore. So we're back to no touch. Uh, we've of course, checked up our entrance fees. Hopefully it will be um, in implementation once we open again. And for now, because we are closed, we'll focus on accessibility online. So I think this is what we have with our new normal. And with that, I would like to thank, uh, if you have to contact the museum, these are, go to our website. Uh, and of course, at the moment, we have no visitors, no fees, no income, no worries, but we'll still continue to help serve you at the museum. So salamat po and stay safe. Thank you. And I'll bring you back to Sir Vallejo. Hey, thank you, JC, for the presentation. At least we get updated for what the preparations for for a new normal will be. I think it will be also good for the other museums uh, in the country, especially museums in the regions and in Metro Manila. Uh, 